Well, welcome everybody. I'm Bill Holmes. I'm with Collectors Maze and uh, many of the Star Wars costing groups. And today we have one of the most well-known names in the design of two of the largest franchises in science fiction, both Star Wars and Alien. Roger Christian, it's such a pleasure um, to have you join us today uh, from Canada uh, in your home. And uh, we look forward to talk to you and learn about a little bit more about your huge impact in, in, in both universes. Yep. Happy to be here and uh, <laughs> lots to talk about, certainly, with those two. Absolutely. They're very big, you know, including like, you know, from the background for our audience, Roger received an, an, an Oscar for Star Wars and an Academy or and oh, I actually got that reversed. I am my apologies. Academy Award for Star Wars and Oscar nomination for Alien, which is really huge in the industry. Yep, unexpected too. So, I mean, science yeah. fiction oh. was uh, very much kind of low level on on the radar for all the studios and for audiences at the time when we made Star Wars and uh, as we'll talk about later but that reflected in having such a tiny budget to do it with and um, it it we never expected it going in there at all and even Alien um, science fiction was so low on on the radar of um, the Academy, even. And I think to this day, actually, I don't know that a science fiction film has actually ever won the Oscar itself. I don't think so. We're hoping it's changing. We kept thinking it would change. We we thought it would change with Avatar, but even that they, they didn't give. No, no doubt. Because, I mean, I mean, as, as you know, I grew up in, in the 70s and, you know, you, science fiction was not mainstream. <laughs> He means nice. especially recognized. So this, you know, that is like one of the big hurdles was getting involved and like just getting funding for Star Wars, which sounds really crazy <laughs> today. You know, uh, it is a billion dollar franchise that you know it's recognized globally. But you know, you know, you know, how did how did you get involved in this project? I mean, you you've got you know, let, let's let's go with Star Wars. I mean. How did you get involved in this? This has got to be like this creative minds going at it. We're going to hear about that. It was um, it was just chance. I was working on a film called Lucky Lady in Wymas in Mexico with the designer John Barry. And uh, we were re kind of doing remaking sets out of old Mexican buildings and things like that. So and it was pretty um, it was an interesting. It was a rum running in the twin in the thirties and forties, whole adventures, and it was written by Gloria and Willard Hike, who happened to have written American Graffiti, mm -hmm. and were friends with George. And um, the the story goes that um, each of the studios were kind of worried about the box office so that each studio took on a young director to try and revive their um, their business. And Alan Ladd Jr. at Fox liked American Graffiti and took on George. George came into his office with his worst nightmare, a sci-fi fantasy for children. And um, so he kind of was backing George, not the film, and they put it to the um, to the business affairs in Fox, who estimated the film would make $12 million. That's all. And they divided the budget in three. So they said to George, if you can make it for $4 million, we'll do the movie. So there was little risk to them. Um, now, Gary Kurtz had scoured America and there was no studios available. And in Britain at the time, we were exactly half the price of America. So his $8 million budget could be done in Britain for $4 million. And we had loads of stages free. It was not very busy at the time. And that, so Gloria and Willard um, have become great friends with John and I. They're, they're fantastic writers and they're great, fun people. And sadly, she's gone. But um, 
Willard's still around. And um, they suggested George, who was talking about his spaghetti western in space, to come down and see what we were doing because we fitted the bill for the budget and everything. And that's what happened. George arrived with Gary. He saw what I was doing. I was spreading salt for an old salt factory where there was a, an action scene. And mm -hmm. uh, George being George, I, I mean, we're all like students, honestly. We look like it. He mm -hmm. picked up a shovel and was shoveling salt and talking about this, you know, spaghetti western in space. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I was quite honest. I said I really didn't connect to any science fiction before, and I read science fiction a lot. I was unusual at that time in Britain, but I liked it. And um, he described his kind of version, and, and I said, well, you know, it's like an old car to me, dripping oil, and you keep repairing it, and they've kept it going. You know, as I found out later when I read the script when we started... I had exactly described the Millennium Falcon. Um, and so George hired John Barry first, um, Jeffrey Unsworth, the DP, who couldn't make it at the end, and me, I was the third person, and we were told to be in um, London on August the 1st, which we I did. 20th Century Fox had not agreed the budget, so there was no money to make it with. And there was no money for developing. Mm -hmm. And um, so George paid us out of money he was owed for, for, on American Graffiti. And John and I and Les Dilly, an art director, set up shop in um, in a tiny studio in London. And I read the script and thought, I can't make this. <laughs> we were announced the budget was $4 million. We were told in London our art department budget was nothing. And my set decorating budget was more suitable for a little modern kind of comedy. But me being me, and I'd realised this was a dream job, and I really liked George, we got on. So I said, I, we're going to have to make this work. Um, and in fact... It kind of all it kind of all evolved from R two D two because reading the script we knew we could make C three PO because mm -hmm. they got a gold ray, uh, robot in um, Metropolis with an actor inside oh. we knew we could do that better the the radio control in Britain at the time was terrible it was primitive there was no CGI there's nothing so how to make this tiny robot r2d2 under four feet um so we got stuck in i got a carpenter who'd made all the monty python films and um they really had no money <laughs> they, had, they couldn't even afford horses on holy grail um and bill had some wood at home in his garage so we built a mock-up around kenny baker who we'd realized Basically, because of the Daleks in Doctor Who, if we put someone in it, we could make it work. And um, Kenny Baker was three foot eight. So we built that round him. I found a Bill said he couldn't make a top. It was too complicated. And I found an old lamp top in a junk pile, which we bought for 10 shillings. Mm -hmm. That fitted, stuck that on the top. I got some aircraft nozzle bits and pieces, stuck it on. And... Um, we he could not make it move and this is the two-leg version we got his boots and and bill stuck those inside the bottom of the legs and he still couldn't move it and i'd bought a, an old fighter pilot's harness in mm -hmm. some junk i bought you know for nothing 10 shillings i bought a whole pile of junk that i thought we might be able to use and we stapled that inside, and Kenny could actually wear <laughs> R2D to the wooden one like a rucksack. And um, so he took three steps in it. George was there and Gary, and uh, that's probably the most auspicious moment on Star Wars because we knew George could make his movie. Without that, we couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, I went to... Um, my kind of pet peeve were guns, and I knew from the amount we needed, I couldn't make any. We didn't have the money to make them. Mm -hmm. So I went to the gun hire 
um, facility in London Baptist, who they were all friends of mine. I've, I've got guns from them throughout my career. And um, I took the Sterling submachine gun, which I loved, and I thought I could mm -hmm. just use it as it is. This is a sci fi weapon to me. It is. But no, I, it totally. Yeah, so I thought I'd better change it. So I stuck T strip around the barrel, found in their box of old, unused stuff some sights that I could stick on the top, and changed the big uh, bullet clip for a tiny one they had, a small one. And the adventure was it could fire still. You could get a blast out the end mm -hmm. of it. Um, and then I thought, well, you know, he's on about spaghetti westerns and Han Solo is really a gunslinger. So I found the Mauser, which I loved, this German World War II pistol. And it had a wooden handle. And so I did the same. I stuck all these um, sights on the top just to give it a little bit of a change it just a bit, but keep it old and used. And I called George over and said, you better come and see what I'm doing. I didn't tell anyone what I was doing. So um, fortunately, I didn't get fired. He loved the idea of them and they could fire. <laughs> and he stayed with me, actually. And we made Princess Leia's gun with super glue. That's wow. how it started. Um, and we made a mock-up of the land speeder on wheelbarrow wheels from wheelbarrows that Bill had three in his garage. And um, he made it out of wood and polystyrene. Mm -hmm. Much too big, the first one, because John followed the script and it was a four-seater. And then George said, no, no, he'd only have a battered old two-seater like an old sports car, Luke. So we made a little two-seater one. Um, there were some funny stories around that too, making that. But that was the genesis when Fox finally committed, and they had to because the studios then were getting booked and Stanley Kubrick wanted the studio we were in. And they said, if you don't pay now, you've lost it. So they came in and we moved to um, Elstree Studios January the 6th. And we were shooting at the end of March which is an insane short time for a science fiction mm -hmm. movie. And I knew then I couldn't make anything. I just had to find objects for every single thing I was doing. And I came up also with not being able to make the sets properly in the, in the studio, you know, workshops. I came up with this crazy idea. If I got airplane scrap, which looked like the interior of a submarine or a, or a bomber, Mm -hmm. that I could buy it and I could use it to build the sets and scrap and put it around, you know, in Tunisia and, and the other places. And that's what they all agreed with, that that was a way to do it. And I, I only say now the only reason that George went along with that was because he made THX um, mm -hmm. and understood the process of what I had to go through to get it done and John. Um and it kind of started there. We just, I went around four airfields in England, <laughs> found oh, junk. Like and, a scavenger hunt, you know? <laughs> well, the, the thing was, nobody wanted it. It was sold by Wade. So I could buy mm -hmm. Rolls Royce Derwent engines for nothing. I, I think I could buy mm -hmm. half an airplane for 50 pounds. So I was, I got masses of it, which I knew I would need. Um, and it kind of fulfilled a lot of the look of Star Wars based from that. And I, I had a buyer and I was getting him. I said, anything you can find, calculators that are broken, camera parts. There was no computers then. There's no CGI. There was no none of that to, um, to, to get to use. It was just whatever machinery he could find me. You know, that's totally it. And think about this. Let's talk about the, the look. I think, you know, we've talked about a lot of what you, you know, said to get to this point. But now, this, I mean, Star Wars and Alien both, but, you know, Star Wars was a pioneer. Changed science fiction just by the look of it. Could we talk a little bit about that? Because that, that's, I mean, did those... The both both franchises did something very different and took a different direction and kind of why you guys went that direction well i it was my pet peeve i i, I mean i didn't like you know, i loved the graphic novels and of um 
of, of Flash Gordon, things like that, <laughs> but I just didn't connect to the movie and I didn't connect to any of them. There, there was a couple of movies that I connected to. One was Alphaville, which John mm -hmm. Luke Goddard made on the streets of Paris, and he made the streets of Paris with a handheld Bolex camera look like an alien city. Mm -hmm. I like Solaris. I like the, the what he'd done with a space station that was dripping and collapsing and falling apart. I'd never seen that before. Um, I I was I was always in the queue in London in Denmark Street, the origins of Forbidden Planet, the big um, the big uh, fan store, if you like, science fiction store. I was always in there getting graphic novels. And I love Bilal, who's a Romanian artist who his woman trap is just broken down England. It was just to me, it appealed to me. I don't know why that that since from childhood, even then I used to get my dinky toys and paint them down and put them in the garden <laughs> and photograph them and try to make them look really old and real. I, I had this mission to get it to look like that. And, you know, being forced with a lack of budget created a kind of opportunity whereby I could actually bring this to light in the way that I thought it should look. You know, John Barry took um, George to Tunisia because he wanted to make Tatooine very real. And John had designed the little prince there, so he knew it. And again, it's kind of almost like reality science fiction, just some of the domes on the buildings. But if you if you just set it as a science fiction environment, it becomes science fiction. It's a real planet. All I had to do then was to dress in bits of electronic junk. that, And mm -hmm. I put in a huge plethora of the um, heating containers that they heated the food on airliners. I bought mm -hmm. loads of those aluminium. They're all around. They're scattered around. There's different um, plexiglass stuff. <laughs> Most of it's kind of junk that we just took down and, and used there. And I, you know, I think it's it kind of based from the guns. I just wanted guns to be real. I just seeing science fiction, they're going beep, beep, and they look plasticky, and no one mm -hmm. believed it. You could believe a Western why not do a Western in space? You know, I think George's original idea. So that, that there was a kind of universal moment where things collided, which were my vision, George's vision. Mm -hmm. And John Barry, John Barry always secretly said, no, I am I prefer Barbarella. He liked all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but John was an incredibly smart and talented man and, and very... Um, open to the director's vision what he wanted you know he designed clockwork orange for um stanley kubrick and john immediately embraced this whole idea and knowing that he couldn't build much you know in the studios we had to build the death star make that look real as well but there was this combination and it was very hard to make a crew understand <laughs> who, <laughs> who didn't understand the script at all. Even Les, the art director, said he says it in interviews now, you know, oh, I, I just thought it was a pile of crap when I read it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very hard to even convince them. And I remember George actually showed the crew when we first went into the Elstree studios, Once Upon a Time in the West, for the costumes particularly, there, there was, you know, the impact of um, of the, the way gunslingers were, those mm -hmm. kind of costumes. And then Henry, uh, Henry Ford. Mm -hmm. No, not Henry Ford. What am I talking about? Um, Henry Fonda. Sorry. <laughs> Henry no, no Fonda was dressed in black. And it was the only time he ever played a bad guy. He'd never done one before, and I don't think he ever did afterwards. But the impact, these were things that were very influential in trying to get an audience to understand, but they didn't. You know, the traditional art departments, costumes, everybody. Oh, it's a period film. Okay, oh, let's look at this. Oh, these are paintings. Oh, this is how it is. Mm -hmm. 
when you start science fiction, there is nothing to reference. It became, it became <laughs> afterwards easier because Star Wars, Alien, Blade Runner gave reference that everybody went back to and said, oh, that's what I want. We didn't have one reference, nothing. There was nothing to go to apart from what I was saying, these kind of books. And, and I began my career with a brilliant designer, John Box, as his tea boy, and he designed... Dr. Zhivago, Lawrence of Arabia, I worked on uh, Oliver. And the sets on Oliver, I think, set my career in motion because the sets, the old canals, Dickensian London and everything are just staggeringly real and beautiful. So his knowledge has followed me through my entire career that John Box, um, I watched very carefully and learned what he did and how he did it. I think all those combinations came into Star Wars and there it was, you know, there was an opportunity for me to do a movie that I thought an audience, because I'm the audience, would respond to and accept. And in, mm -hmm. and if a designer and a set decker, if we've done our job properly, no one notices it. We don't get praise for it because it's there you just accept mm -hmm. it as real and and that, i think star wars was the first science fiction film ever where an audience didn't even have to think about it we were just in a real place no i, I totally get that as someone who you know, i i was five in 1977 when i watched i mean i you know with my dad and, and you know keep in mind i'm a five-year-old with a very limited attention span right and I didn't move the entire time. The the open, you know, the the the, yes. the verse, the, the verse, and then the opening yeah. crawl. I couldn't even read it. I couldn't even yes. read it, but I'm, I'm mesmerized <laughs> by it. You know, and you know, I you know, I'm picking out sight words and that, and then all of a sudden, the ships come yeah. up. And it's, it, it, you know, and then the time passes, the movie's over, and I, and, you know, and I'm still, my jaw is dropped at five. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I think that's the impact was from five to ninety years old. It was. There wasn't yeah. my dad, who was, um, uh, you know, he he was a he was a, a dad later in life, and you know, older older, and he was just completely lost. He's a western. He liked westerns. Right. right. He, he totally identified with the right. genre. This would not. I mean, science fiction was not his genre. It was right. not his. And then he comes in and watches this, and he's like, "Star Wars, yes. yeah, <laughs> yeah." That, so, so that connectivity obviously was extremely successful. I mean, yes. I mean, you you know, the lines, the you know, people were you know, no one expected, like you said, like Fox didn't expect this to go no. everywhere. It did. No, not at all. No, but it resonated with the audiences, and and you know, and it, and it and it's fascinating. I, you know, I want to talk a little bit about you know, uh, Galaxy Built on Hope. But I thought one of the most interesting quotes in there was from um, Gareth Edwards, and you know, and he he said that like, you know, normally like Star Wars fans try to explain why they're so passionate about Star Wars to everyone. But he's like, you know, it, it really should be that everyone should explain if they are not passionate about Star Wars. You know, everyone wants to be, you know, ever, ever, ever since Star Wars, you watch that and you're like, you either want to be in space or make movies about space. That's what <laughs> happened. Yeah, it inspired so many filmmakers. James Cameron, um, Christopher Nolan, Guillermo del Toro. Um, Gareth Edwards, as you said. I mean, there's a whole list of them. James Gunn, I heard, same story. It it and it inspired an entire world. And I, to me, George created a perfect myth. We all live with myths and legends. When I was growing up, it was King Arthur, and I would fight with Excalibur, you know, um, and and westerns. But um, I I think George provided something that was needed in the world and is still needed in an even more expanding way now you know i have a 10 year old now and he's star wars mad and it's not because of what i did he came into it on his own from outside from school 
you know, you know, it's it, it, it's impact. You know, it, it is. Um, and I'm in education myself, and it's funny the students. You know, uh, this is 2023, and and they still know all of the characters. It's, it's yes. part of pop culture, the iconic. Yes. Even if they've never seen the movies, they know the images. Yes. Yeah, and that's so they recognize. No, it is, and it is it's global, global. Absolutely, yeah. it's not something just you know limited to Europe and the U.S. and that's, all over the world, the excitement that people have um, yeah. for this franchise and, and how it, you know, you know, and then kind of, you know, kind of going to that is like, and I want to talk a little bit about Alien because I would be like completely remiss. I know you Star Wars, but I'm also very much, you know, the <laughs> idea of you know, Alien kind of changed something. Other element was sci fi and horror together. I mean, you know, I know, I know a lot of people don't really, I mean, back in the day, you know, I, I think we're more of it as a sci-fi horror, but I think in this in modern era, I think that the horror element gets lost in, in Alien too, because, you know, there was a, this was a very unique, um, you know, story, um, you know, Ridley Scott came, you know, this is a very distinct story in that. And and how did how did how did you get involved with Alien after this is like boom you know you you, you know, Star Wars you know you've got this going and then you got a new new opportunity I kind of want to talk a little bit about Alien I um well I knew Ridley and Tony very well I I, I art directed commercials for both of them so I knew them anyway um, and the opportunity opportunity after i was wanting to direct and after star wars mm -hmm. i went straight on to another film the final remake of beau Geste with marty feldman and then we were doing life of brian which is the monty python picture um and alien had started and and uh ridley had got a designer who'd never done science fiction before um and a set decorator the same he, he was and so they they got it designed and I, oh, Lord Delphont read the script for Life of Brian it was, I was two weeks, everything was packed up and I'd, I'd even packed up my um, the car, everything ready to go um, and he cancelled it on the spot because he said it's blasphemous and he couldn't be involved in it so <laughs> so um, I was in the London office that where they were going through with me and said, we are going to make it. We're going to get the money. We want you to stay on board because I designed it with, with Terry Gilliam. And uh, that same day, Ridley called me personally and said, what are you doing? And he said, I've heard the film's gone down. Get down to Shepherd and right now. So I drove down. They put me in an office. And when I walked in, there were all these Giga originals outside of Ridley's office. And I was just walking around and I, I knew Ridley I, to me, he's, his head is a camera. He's got uh, the best visual sense of any director ever. And um, seeing that I think he's Ridley. And then they said, read the script right now. So I read it very fast. This script was like a um and I said, yeah, yeah, I'm on board. They said, well, can you start right away? And I said, yeah, yeah, sure. Be and it was a similar situation that, that this was the first R-rated science fiction movie and Fox didn't know that it would work. So they were, it was way under budgeted. Even when I joined, which was, I don't know how many weeks before shooting, they cut 600,000 out of the budget, which at that time was only about 6 million all of that comes out of the art department. There isn't anything else. There's no stars in it. Um, and Ridley said, look, what I want is a space truck, an old space truck that's been used. And obviously he loved the Millennium Falcon holds that I'd done because that was the kind of look, but he wanted it more kind of army-like. And then in the first two days, he showed his crew, everybody, Dr. Strangelove, and came out, said, I want, look at it. It's like, I want it like hair, the interior. 
even Michael Seymour came to me and said, what does he mean, hair? What? I don't understand. And I said, he wants it covered in switches and pipes and what a ship would look like. They're not beautifully panelled and, you know, 2001 had its own kind of brilliant look, but that's not how they are. You look at a Apollo, the old space um, capsules that went up, they're filled with junk and switches and everything. <laughs> so I got stuck in. Um, and in fact, Ridley wanted to screen test Sigourney Weaver, who, of course, was unknown. And the studios, of course, wanted a star in the lead role. And he didn't want to do the usual screen test, which is a you know, plant and a white wall and an actress saying something. So to kind of show everybody what I would do, I, I brought my three pop boys over from Star Wars because I'd already mm. trained them how to break down junk, how to, because you don't just stick it randomly on walls. It doesn't work. It looks terrible. You have to do it in a mechanical kind of mm -hmm. engineered, even though it's fake, way. Mm -hmm. um, so they knew how to do it. Uh, Michael Seymour employed some kid, I don't know why, who'd never done a movie before, who convinced him he could do what I did. And his, he, uh, I don't know, he got bits of scrap. So I just said, sorry, I got the buyer. And I said, go out and buy truckloads of airplanes and everything. <laughs> Broke it down. And they built a piece of the corridor. And I dressed it like an army truck, like I would do and I did for the Millennium Falcon. And um, that became the look of Star Wars and the, all of Alien. All we changed were there were porthole windows mm -hmm. in the, and it's on YouTube. I think you can see that screen test of Sigourney, and and the windows lost the claustrophobia that Ridley wanted. He wanted it all inside. You know, you couldn't get out, and a window made it possible to look out so uh, and look in. So. Mm -hmm. that they got rid of but then that was it i just got stuck in um with a crew with very little time again um and yeah I, I i say afterwards i i think if if every film i got right was alien the sets everything and ridley's idea to to make it like a ship that you went into and you couldn't get out they they built the two stages were there were linked two of the big stages at Shepherdon had a link with a door we opened the door they built it like a snake going around all the stages and in fact when you went in one bit of the set you couldn't get out you had to walk through the ship that gave Ridley that chance to do those almost like the Mary Celeste the ship that when he did those tracking shots in the open going around the ship, it gave you that feeling that you were really in space. It, these aren't three-sided sets mm -hmm. where you're lighting. These were interior lighting, everything. And I think that came together with Ridley's vision and a great cast. Um, what is interesting is both those films, George always said on the day, I'm not doing a science fiction film, I'm doing a documentary. <laughs> and Ridley, in effect, it's the same on Alien. It was a documentary about a crew in, stuck inside a, a spaceship being <laughs> chased by a monster that they couldn't get out of. No, that's you know you're right. There is a, that whole feel. I mean, it is a, an immersive story where you connect with the characters. I mean, you, yeah. you feel the characters. It, it's just you know an amazing. And I and I guess the other thing it is you know you think about like other than you know Alec Guinness, <laughs> both movies really had very little name. You know, a, you know the actors were all new and. Yeah, and starting, and yeah. you know, you know, it, it, there wasn't a name, but it, it, but it, everyone got totally immersed. It didn't. It wasn't. A, it wasn't drawing by name. It was drawing by just the sheer story performance. Yes. Yeah, everyone, think, everyone believed it. I think that's the thing. Yes. That, that, that's the synergy that everyone. Got. 
got in, they believed it. Yeah, because they weren't looking at actors who they were familiar with. Even Alec Guinness looks so different as Obi Wan oh, yes. and anything that comes out of his mouth is so capturing. You know, you just believe every word of it. He's just that kind of. That's his um, the way he is and his personality that comes through. So they were also watching characters who they could identify with, and each each film had someone the audience could cling on to mm -hmm. yeah. we we made you know ridley um and the bridge went <clears throat> itself the, the, and we had had ron cobb also mm -hmm. and and going back to star wars i have to say and i try in the documentary to bring to light ralph Macquarie because i think he deserves a gigantic place in the evolution of how Star Wars is. He's a, just a genius as a, and and six little paintings that George came with. There's Star Wars in it. There was a, a reference if we had anything, and Ron Cobb, and Giga, Ron Cobb is just an amazing science fiction artist, you know. And he could draw up. I would go to him and say, Ron, I need to put a ship that could be in the hole that would go and move around mm -hmm. on the planet he would draw it with engines everything in detail working um both of them see ralph Macquarie actually worked at boeing um mm -hmm. designing drawing up engines and um ron cobb was a science fiction artist of you know and, and very familiar with airplanes mm -hmm. They they are very important in this kind of look of this whole film. Very important components. Um, <clears throat> and the bridge, I went to him and said, because the first drawings that were done were looked like Star Trek bridge, you know, that mm -hmm. I don't think anyone would believe. And um, it works for Star Trek brilliantly. That's that kind of thing. But th this bridge, Ridley wanted it squashed he he lowered the ceiling on the on it down three times he drove michael seymour mad and the carpenters because they kept saying no lower lower and he wanted it to get it into the cinemascope frame so it was always mm -hmm. above you and again we found <clears throat> disused um, fighter seats and and mm -hmm. um they adapted those as special effects boys and and i i stuck in cups and bits of stuff that the crew would have left behind because mm -hmm. that's how it is that's how life is yeah. you know drove me mad that set i mean just getting that encrusted and and looking right um it was it was such a and they they landed that in my lap they said you take care of the bridge and i said oh it was a monster of coordination, trying to get it all to work. You know, there were video playbacks. All of this stuff was only in its infancy, really. But we got it done. And here's a typical alien story. Um, the first thing that you see the ship coming to life is the reflection of the computer readout in that visor. Mm -hmm. No one knew how to do it. And um, I... I'd done some stuff with Derek Jarman, who's a famous British um, uh, artist, whereby we were doing stuff on 8 mil projector. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, if you can get me some form of readout, I think I could project into the helmet. And the helmet was was um, a, an old motorbike helmet, so we adapted, mm -hmm. put visor on it. And Ridley said, yeah, go along with it. And so I got it. I was holding the projector, moving around till it got it to read and the right size. And then Ridley said, turn over, and he shot it. And that's what went into the film. Wow. And on those early move around the ship, there was mm -hmm. one point we put on the pecking bird. That was Ridley's idea to have a pecking, um, those birds that went into the water. They're, they're, um, they're, they're never stopped doing the movement we had one of those for fun in there but he wanted air conditioning to be blowing the papers mm -hmm. 
uh, and the, we were actually shooting. And then he said, he looked at me and said, what do you think? And I grabbed the hairdryer off the makeup artist. I got under the <laughs> set, which was extremely excruciatingly painful and say, when the papers are right, tell me, I'll blow it around. And I did. And then that's how we shot it. Wow. That was alien, really, the whole thing. <laughs> no, no, but it's fascinating because, you know, it, it, those little details made so much difference in, in, in the movie. Because, I mean, I remember the scene when it came up and you're reading the readout. Yeah. you know, And, and I remember the paper blowing and, and the little woodpecker, whatever, the little the pecking yeah. bird, whatever that it's called. Yes. I, I'm struggling with it, too. You know, I remember those that scene and, you know, and you're, like, going through this whole thing and it's just, like, you were, you know, you were in a real place. Yes. You know, like you were just walking around this real place, looking at all of these things where people were living or had been, you know, at some point. Yes. And, you know, and it, it is, it is so fascinating um, that that part. And I think that is the beauty of this is connectivity and connecting out. But, you know, one of the things I want to kind of touch on is some of some of the work that you've done and like in recording this i think i think the history that you have in all this is is so profound i um i know you have a book the cinema alchemist can you tell us a little bit about that so i um i i just got on with work and and had been very quiet about it and i've always been friends with george i've never misused the trust that he had in me and I had in him and I've never gone to him for anything else and not, not done anything that would rock the boat as far as Star Wars. I'm 100% supportive and George. Um, and um, I was, David West Reynolds, mm -hmm. who wrote the early Star Wars books about how everything was made and everything, his, his is a long story, which is in the book, but um, he was head of literature he became at, at the ranch so i was directing the second unit on phantom menace and um mm -hmm. there's always a picnic in july at the ranch there always was mm -hmm. and um i was there and david came running down to me and said you're you're roger i'll finally get to meet you and i need to pick your brains and he started going on like this and everything so i was of course answering him and telling him mm -hmm. And then he said, I don't care. You're the only person who can tell these stories. I have gone through the archive. There's not even any reference or mention of you or John Barry anywhere. We did have interviews done by Charlie Lippincott at the time on the set. Mine was missing. So <laughs> when John Rinsler wrote The Making of Star Wars, he didn't know who I was or, or had no idea of what had gone on. Um so he said, you've got to write the book. You've got to do this. Sorry, it's a legacy. There's no one else knows how Star Wars was made. And all of the the, the props, the sets, the, um, the everything that is involved with all of that, robots, weapons, mm -hmm. um, land speeders, vehicles, anything. And in those days, the set decorator did it all. Nowadays, mm -hmm. Christopher Nolan, when I met him, he said, I don't understand. You did it all. He said, nowadays, one person does a vehicle, one does this, mm -hmm. one does that. It's all split up. So in the end, I thought, you know what? And I, I, I'd had s some time and I took time off and I just sat down and wrote 630 pages because I, I do have a very good memory, thank goodness. Um, and then knowing that... It, um, no one had done Alien either, and I thought, well, I should probably include that and, mm -hmm. and the making of this Black Angel, my short film that George comes yeah. with. And um, so having met with the whoever, it's Chris and Lynn at the ranch then on Skywalker, were responsible for everything that went out, um, I had to get permission to do it. And the one person who had to decide was John Rinsler, who was then the head of literature. He'd taken over mm -hmm. from David West Reynolds. And so John just said to me, who's editing your book? And I said, who? 
How can I find anybody <laughs> who knows about this stuff who's not going to be completely cross-eyed about it and wondering and, and what to do? And he said, well, I'll do it. And that was, it was a phone conversation and it was the fastest kind of deal I've ever made. And <laughs> said, mm -hmm. fine. So John edited my book down to about 300 pages and that was Cinema Alchemist, which is out now. And it has... At that time, no one had ever written anything about the making of Alien. I just kept reading bits and pieces, but there was mm -hmm. nothing. John Rins has finally now done the book, which I helped a great deal with him. Um, and it came about like that. And I thought, you know what, I've got to do this because this few little cinema kind of revolutionaries <laughs> down in the dirt on the first one everyone now sees these massive Hollywood movies and um, I don't know if you can hear there's jets going over it's, it's a Labour Day this weekend and they have jets flying all over the city oh, on yeah, Monday. Yeah. Um, and they're practicing and they come right over here um, no I can't hear a thing oh, good. I, I don't yeah. know if you heard earlier which was you didn't even miss me but I, I was laughing because the test fire alarm went off and I'm oh like, really oh I didn't hear yeah. it no no, I was like laughing to myself. I was oh, like, really? <laughs> that's like the soundproofing is really good on some of the new right. technology because right. I was like, la I was kind of like going, Oh, that's why you were looking around. I saw you. I thought, oh, That's why I looked around. I was like, I kind of like looked around real quick because I'm like, <laughs> Is it really a fire? You know? Uh, and, uh, but um, so that was the history of it. And, you know, and I thought it was a legacy that had to be done. So, um, and it's, I wrote it as a mentoring experience, basically, mm -hmm. kind of giving back. And the last line in the book says, it, don't let anyone tell you you can't, you can. And I wrote mm -hmm. it with that perspective, not just for even Star Wars fans, for everybody in the world to um, kind of get stuck in and do something and, and do it to your best ability, even if there's no money and no one believes you because the crew didn't, they didn't. You know, we were very mm -hmm. isolated. Um, and George finally kind of came out with it on a Christopher Nolan interview that's on YouTube, where he, he told Christopher, he said, you know, there were only five people on that film stood by my side, and that was the art department. And it's true. Um, mm -hmm. It's not anything out of we became friends with them the four months we were in this little tiny studio. John and I were doing a, something that we thought was profoundly kind of important for cinema mm -hmm. in terms of creating science fiction that mm -hmm. has become the biggest genre really now in cinema. It's huge. And this was fledgling in 77. So I think, you know, I thought I better put it down and um, get, get it out. <laughs> So it's on Amazon now, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and and yeah, it took two years of my life to really get it done. But um, and and Lucasfilm, they gave me um, they gave me free run of the archives. I went through every single mm -hmm. photograph, and unfortunately, you know, everything was binned, junked after the first Star Wars. There was no belief in it. Every, no one thought this is never going to make a sequel or even get to cinema so everything was junked um that's how in a way that's how david west reynolds came into it because he's an archaeologist he's he's not science fiction but he was a huge step right of the head of the jet he was a <laughs> science fiction nerd and um while he was on a dig in egypt he thought you know these star wars locations and sets Sorry. I can't hear myself. You're fine. <laughs> Thank you, Ty. Um, so he thought these sets should be part of history, and people should be able to go and visit mm -hmm. them, like a like a dig, you know, like a mm -hmm. archaeology. And when he called 20th Century Fox and he called Lucasfilm, no one knew where we'd actually shot. There was no records. Yeah. On his own money, he went with a crew and with clips of the film, because he's an archaeologist, he found mm -hmm. every single, not only locations, but every shot we did. You know, I, I, there's another story in there. We, mm -hmm. we, we 
I found the skeleton dinosaur bones. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't afford to make one, and we weren't going to do it, but the, the uh, prop master was tearing down the big attic prop that mm -hmm. no one was ever using. And he said, if there's anything you want, take it. And there was a dinosaur, full-scale dinosaur skeleton. So I took it down and we laid it in the desert. And to me, it was really important. It gave a history. There's something, yeah. you know, you, did I guess that this would become the craw dragon and go into Mandalorian? No, mm -hmm. it set a precedent. But Robert Watts said, I can't afford to take that back, Roger. We'll just leave it in the desert. And we left it. Um, and David West Reynolds found it. <laughs> after oh, my days, gosh. Three that days is... of searching. He also, oh my... he also found the cantina door. And it was um, acting as a gate to keep chickens in by the local farmer. <laughs> and the dome we'd put on top of the cantina was upside down, filled with water, mm. and it's for goats to drink. It was a <laughs> you so, know, watching, you know, when I was watching Galaxy of Home, oh my God, I, I was like watching him trace and just like literally going, you know, we're in a desert. I think I remember this line, we're in a desert. So every track was going to stay in place, yes. you know, the way. Correct. So, so, so like literally he was following all these car. Yep. And, you know, and he knew, I think, I think where it was like, he knew Algeria was on the left. Yes, and I think that was the, that is the directions he got. Algeria is on the left. That's all he was told by Robert Watts. That's all that he knew. When when you leave Tozer, on your way mm -hmm. to Algeria, turn left. Now this is like two hundred thousand miles of desert and shots and everything. So yeah, he found it. A young kid showed him. A young local kid who was walking by on a camel train. Mm -hmm. But. Um, so yeah, I felt I'd had to do it, and and subsequent to that, then there was David West Reynolds again was forcing me to make a documentary of it because everyone likes when I tell the stories and things, and um, oh, they just happen now to be doing it. So um, I managed, we managed to get a bit of funding independently. It was made exactly mm -hmm. like Star Wars, this documentary. Mm -hmm. and, um, then COVID struck and I was landlocked in Canada I planned to go and visit places all over America and UK to interview all those things so I found a virtual studio and I managed to do it with green screen and mm -hmm. put people with me and it was made similar way with no money just an editor and I and in fact the post house who are, who are friends of mine who own it they gave me a room during COVID we were allowed a certain number of people in their facility and we we just made up the limit so we had a, a year that the editor and i we did it all ourselves everything um and now what i sent you was originally was went out as a kind of fan special mm -hmm. but it never got promoted in america yet um and i made blu-rays and dvds of that and some went out and now they've the idea, and I already planned it, was to make it six half-hour episodes, mm -hmm. which is what we've done. And they now stopped selling the Blu-rays because they're trying to um, trying to get it sold to a streamer, basically. No, but you know, watching the preview, I mean, I I was you know, I was sitting here watching it, and I could not stop watching. Yeah, that's what everyone did. So I put breaks. In are, it. I mean. Uh, <laughs> the breaks are great, you know, the interview. Well, I did that the... for people to have a pee or, or go and get a cup yeah. of tea and a coffee. <laughs> no, no. And it gets, but it's like just the amount of people that was also involved in it. In the, it, it, it was a story and it, 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 it was a story about storytelling. Yes. Yes. And, 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 and archaeo and you had the archaeology to it, the search for this and then talking to people and just listening to the, you know, People's effect not only Star Wars but the universe and how it was created, galaxy. It was just, you know, I have to say it was it, it, it was just, you know, it's kind of nice from as a fan point of view to look at it. And I mean, a 
lot of the stuff we do when, uh, when we build props now, you are our architect, you know, you're, yeah. the one, you know, this is what <laughs> I look at when I'm building something or doing something. But the, the fascination of this is just like, it's, it's just this amazing story that has kind of filled the universe with, uh, without kind of trying <laughs> if yes. that makes sense. yeah you know that you know it's not wasn't forced it was very fluid and, and it had vision and it but yet you know it wasn't like any it, it was just a creative storm that just people came in and just did all these amazing things and then boom it's there <laughs> yes yeah that's true you know and i tried to do it like we did it like that it's not made out of ego it's just made out of oh. factual kind of how do we do it and so i just wanted to show people yeah we did it somehow we did it against a huge amount of opposition and lack of money but we did it and um there was a belief in the script I, you know I, I was a huge king arthur fan mm -hmm. i knew when i read the script when I read the lightsaber, I knew, well, they were called laser swords then in the first script, but uh, I knew that would become the icon of Star Wars like Excalibur mm -hmm. is to Arthur. You know more about Excalibur. Um, you know, and that, that actually was the hardest thing for me to find because it's a weapon of a Jedi. You know, it had to be special. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I was only dealing with found objects. I wasn't going to design one and make it. I, want, I had to find something. We didn't have time either. Um, and I, it was sheer chance. I, I stuck three camera parts together and made Luke's binoculars. And I thought, just so the audience knows what it is, I'll stick two camera lenses on the front. And when I mm -hmm. bought the lenses from a friend of ours, a manager of a camera shop, in London, I just had to say to him, David, is there anything I could use? I've got to make this kind of weapon for a science fiction movie. And he pointed me to some boxes under a shelf that loads of them and said, well, have a look under there. Mm -hmm. Typical English, go and have a rummage around and see what you can find. <laughs> and um, the first box I pulled out, there were these graphics handles. And I, I just looked at it like the Sterling and I thought, that's it. That's all I need. There's something beautifully designed for another purpose. When you replace that purpose with something else, you don't know what anything does on it, but it just looked right. It had a red button and everything. And I raced back to the studios. I had tea strip left over from the Sterling um, mm -hmm. barrel. So I cut them into strips, put them around for a handle. I made a handle out of it. And and again, I, I was breaking down the Texas Instruments calculator and I'd found the bubble strip that illuminated the numbers and it fitted because the only thing mm -hmm. I didn't like was the clip with the Graflex mm -hmm. battery pack clipped onto the camera. So that went in there and it became like, oh, this is kind of an energy. It's something that looked functional. Mm -hmm. And I showed George, and they were heavy, and he just loved it. And that was it. That became Luke's lightsaber. And and Obi-Wan Kenobi's has a piece of a um, Rolls-Royce engine, and a, a, it's a kind of strange firing um, um, grenade. Oh! Which is, it, yeah, you could fire this grenade. It had a Mm -hmm. post on it then yeah that's what it is it's a grenade mostly a piece of a <laughs> stuck together you know no the, you know and these are those i mean you're right the lightsaber is the excalibur yes star wars. it is symbol of, of, of the whole story I mean, you think of yes. one thing and you know i think it, it's fascinating just the, how you got like you know you found the graphics part just started messing <laughs> that in its history. Yeah, it, it kind of had to have that weight of the Jedi's. This is a mystical instrument that had to have mm. that look and weight, and I just felt that was it. And people like it, so... <laughs> oh, very much so. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it, I mean, I think 
no single franchise has ever influenced as many people as Star Wars. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I can't think of anything. I mean, I think other than you know, religious movements, something of that level, ideologies. Well, they say that the most common name in in the world is the Bible name, and then it was Coca-Cola, it's now Star Wars. It is, it really is. It is the lingua franca of the world, you know. No matter where I travel in the world, you know, I I find a Star Wars fan, we sit down, we not even speak the same language, you know, but we can talk. We we, we got this thing. And and I think that is one of the uh, amazing, things about the universe that you know you help create i mean it it is that that you know we have that connection and the passion to the, the to the to this universe that you know kind of was made of junk i mean i yeah, don't literally. want to like it but it really literally it, it's it all made of junk yeah all of it I, and, I, I don't, and, I don't. it is beautiful i mean it and and that that says a lot to the engineering concept that goes in behind it it's like you said you know if you don't put it the right way it's not believable <laughs> no no and i've seen it, people do it like since, a puzzle yeah yeah and it just doesn't work you, you have to have a basic somehow i've got that kind of brain that can see it and, and make mm-hmm. it look like it worked and it's real and functioning mm-hmm. no that yeah. is that is amazing <laughs> I really appreciate your time today. You have, you know, you, your stories. I could honestly. It's a uh, lot. So yeah, we have to stop. Hours. No, I, 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 I wish I didn't. Uh, if I didn't have classes starting, I think I would start like, I would right. just keep rolling. Um, but I want to thank you, Roger. Not for at all. Joining us today. You, it's an amazing your story. Please check out the Cinema Alchemist if you want more information. And that stay on the lookout for you know Galaxy of Hope or I, I know that it will be coming out there because I mean there is no question this is going to be picked up. It is it is it, you know no matter you know I was I sat there and just thought you know I'm gonna I'm gonna passively watch it and I'm like I was glued to it. <laughs> you know it, it, it is a, it's a great a great thing. So again, thank you so Not much for taking your time to talk to you and, and share your wonderful stories with our viewers to that. And as always, may the force be with you all and, and take you, care. And everybody listening. And yeah, and send me a link. Send me a link. Oh, I'll, absolutely. We'll put it out. I will definitely share up and we'll get all this together. Okay. It's great. Nice thank to you meet so you. Much.